Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists 2021 Virtual West Coast event. And thank you so much for being here. I'm Wendy Wirt, Vice President Incoming of the Academy and a Senior Engineer here at the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at the role of leadership in accelerating change in public sector water organizations. Specifically, we're gonna hear from two general managers here in California who are successfully working together to pioneer resource recovery. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. First, just a few brief logistics. Next, the best part, we're gonna hear from our keynote speakers. Then we're gonna go through an interactive guided discussion. So at this point, I would like the facilitators to go ahead and show themselves. Adele and Martin will facilitate breakout room number one. Robert and Brian will facilitate breakout room number two. And Lilia and I will facilitate breakout room number three. So thank you, everyone. Then, so you'll get put into these breakout rooms in the interest of networking. And then after that, don't go anywhere. We will have an opportunity to talk directly with our keynote speakers. Thank you, everyone. Um, the Academy was founded in 1955 for the principal purpose of serving the public by elevating the standards of our profession. Our founders recognized the need for a network of experts to help address complex environmental challenges. This opens it up to our first interactive, first interactive discussion question. Who knows what, so this is our first interactive discussion question. Who knows what BCEE and BCES stand for? If you do, go ahead and enter it into the chat for a chance to win Academy swag. 13 years ago, here in California, the Academy started this annual West Coast event to bring experts together around issues of regional concern. There's been a lot of progress and our event started with leaders from these two organizations, Metropolitan and the Sanitation Districts, 13 years ago in person to discuss sustainability. The Academy today is gonna to use this accessible platform to discuss how this type of leadership can and has influenced innovation. So two board certified environmental engineers and general managers, Adele Hajj Khalil and Robert Ferrante, are going to contribute ideas that can help communities identify major priorities. So did you catch it? <laughs> Two board certified environmental engineers. So there's the answer to the first uh, trivia question for today. Those of you who entered it will be eligible to win Academy swag. Uh, so recognizing the need to combine theory and practice, the Academy's board certification process is similar to that of physicians. So for those of you who have undergone this rigorous peer review process, um, go ahead and use your virtual hand raise. And, um, and then those of us who can, will go ahead and virtually and quietly um, give you some accolades. Now is the best part. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speakers. Adele Hajj Khalil is the winner of the 2021 Edward Cleary Award. Adele has over 32 years of public service experience in the management of water, environmental and infrastructure programs and initiatives. Adele is an award-winning transformational leader anchored in integration, innovation, and inclusion. Adele is a board certified environmental engineer. Our second speaker, Robert Ferrante, is the chief engineer and general manager for the sanitation districts of Los Angeles County. He reports directly to our board of su supervisors, um, which consist of the directors and the mayors of 78 cities located within our service area and the chair of the Board of Supervisors is the representative for the unincorporated area. Robert has been all over the environmental sector for the past 28 years in various roles dealing with wastewater operations, solid waste management, renewable energy, and air quality. 
He is also a board certified environmental engineer. If you have questions for Robert and Nadell, you can enter them in the chat throughout the broadcast. And then later on after our breakout sessions, we'll come back, use that raise hand feature, and you'll have a chance to speak to them directly. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adele to begin the program. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy, and, and great to be with, with Robert and with you all and, uh, and the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. This is an honor and, and great to be with you. Uh, let's just uh, talk about really what we're dealing with today. And I, you heard uh, Wendy talk about uh, the solution and what I believe in is the three eyes, the, the, the integration, innovation, and inclusion. And I think the biggest one of all of them is the last one, which is collaboration, inclusion, working together. And we are facing now the chance of a lifetime that challenge of a lifetime and a chance of a lifetime to really move us forward. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you know, what we're seeing right now is a changing climate across our region. It's real, it's here, and it's gonna get worse. And what we need to do is, is really adapt uh, how we manage our infrastructure uh, to really recognize and adapt to this changing climate. Uh, you know, we, we see that uh, the drought probability is higher in California and the Southwest. Uh, and, you know, Colorado system that we get our water from and Northern California have had drought, serious drought over the last 10 to 20 years. And, and the change that's going to happen is, is now and, and is here. And what we need to do is now adapt to it because our goal is to make sure when we turn the faucet, we all have to be to have water because water is life. And we need to make sure that we're responsive as a region, as a state, as, as a country to this, this changing climate. Uh, you know, uh, next slide. You know, we get uh, about 45% uh, or half of our water imported from the two systems, the Colorado River system and the, the Northern uh, Sierras and in the State Water Project. And really with this, with this change, uh, it's the both systems for the first time are both are stressed at the same time. I don't think that have ever happened. We had one of them stressed, but not both of them. So, uh, and this is really the challenge and we need to work on it. The good news is we've done some good things here in Southern California. The water we're using today is the same water we were using 40 years ago. And we've really adapted and reduced our water consumption by 40% to 50%. But more needs to be done. Next slide. You know, these are kind of the stories you've seen. I was at Lake Oroville about a month ago after the rainstorm, and I just saw, you know, amazing pictures and amazing visual of, of what, uh, how, how bad the conditions are. You know, it's at, at lowest level ever and uh, record low. And, and really, uh, even with the rain that we had, that one uh, storm, which was a, the, the weather storm in like, the last 100 years in one day, it just brought the level up to about 30 feet. And in some places, the water didn't even make it. The reservoir is soaked into the ground. And in Lake Mead, we're seeing the lowest level in Lake Mead. Uh, they were really concerned at, uh, at where we are in Lake Mead. And we really are working on how we make sure that the Colorado River continues to supply our water. We're actually filling the aqueduct because that's important for us. That's the only uh, source of water to make up for the shortage on the state water project. But really we're seeing a huge issue and we're working with our partners uh, on the Colorado River to address the changing climate. And, uh, and we, next slide. And so to me, it's uh, the message that, that what, what made us uh, great in our region is, is Metropolitan came together about a, a hundred years ago, and 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 really this this collaborative, this co-op that came together was to leverage resources to come together, similar to the LA County Sanitation District. We need to work together, leverage each other, leverage resources to really sustain and build water. We're lucky; Northern California does not have what we have, but. What we need to do now is double down on this relationship and continue working together. We have 26 member agencies covering over uh, 50, uh, 200 square miles with 20 million people. Uh, but now what we need to do is continue this relationship and continue working together to provide resilient, affordable water and reliable water for everyone. Next slide. You know, it's uh, what made 
our region, Southern California great, is what happened 100 years ago. You know, water came in through three aqueducts, the LA Aqueduct, the Colorado River Aqueduct, and the California Aqueduct. And, and the, these things really transform our future. But the condition today, 100 years later, is different. So what we need is a new chapter, is a lot of water playbooks, uh, different than importing water. So Metropolitan is, is really transforming itself to not only be in protecting the imported water and storing water, but also becoming the provider of water for our region. And that's not just import water, that's local water supply, groundwater basin uh, storage, and, and working together on, on, on reuse, cleanup, stormwater capture, partnering with everyone to move forward. And what I say right now is we have a chance in a lifetime to move us forward to a what I call the fourth aqueduct. And the fourth aqueduct is, next slide, is the uh, what I call the one water aqueduct. And this is not a pipeline, it's, it's a, a, a multiple things coming together. Local water supply, recycled water, groundwater uh, uh, mitigation, groundwater storage, surface storage, uh, uh, resiliency and connecting pipes together to move water around. That's the future. That's the future of the fourth aqueduct. And, and this is the new playbook that we all have to have. Every drop have to be recycled. Every drop have to be saved. And if we save it, let's store it for the next year. And when we have rain, let's capture the rain and put it in use or store it for the next drought. That's really the future and, and uh, what we have. Next slide. All and I want right. to turn it over to Robert here. Thank you, Adele. Uh, and thank you to the Academy as well for, for hosting this event. I think Adele really touched on the need for uh, transformative change now. We're not, we're not at the point where we can just tweak things. We really have to look for new solutions. Uh, what worked last century uh, in, in, in terms of uh, meeting the water demands is not going to meet uh, the demands today that we have. And I think he did a good job of showing you the impact of drought and climate change. Um, before I get into our side of the story, I do want to talk a little bit about the sanitation districts. Um, we're a little bit smaller than Metropolitan. Uh, we only treat the sewage from about five and a half million people across LA County. We basically handle um, uh, more than half of the county. The city of LA and a, and a few other smaller agencies handle the rest. We are a special district. We're not a county department. We're our own entity. Uh, we're kind of unique with our governance in terms of the fact that uh, we're actually 24 districts working together. We have uh, close to 100 directors. They're all the mayors of the 78 cities. And as Wendy mentioned earlier, the board of supervisors are on our uh, directors and are on our various boards as well. Next slide, please. This kind of shows you our wastewater system uh, that, that we really have separate and distinct systems. Uh, up in Antelope Valley, you can see the Lancaster and Palmdale uh, water reclamation plants. We also have a couple of plants in the Santa Clarita Valley. 90% uh, of our flow and over 90% of the population that we serve is down in the lower LA basin. And um, we recycle already from 10 of our 11 plants, uh, those purple triangles. And that those plants produce tertiary uh, water and that water is mostly allocated. Uh, there's still a little bit of it that uh, is discharged uh, and is not uh, allocated either to for groundwater recharge or for industrial users or for irrigation. Some of our water is dedicated also for habitat as well. But um, the, the uh, water that's really out there for us uh, to, to put together a big project is at our Joint Water Pollution Control Plant. That's the blue triangle. That's in Carson. Uh, and if I can go to the next slide, here's a close-up of that facility. Uh, the facility is designed to handle uh, 400 million gallons per day of wastewater. Uh, and that's dry weather flow. It can handle more, of course, during wet weather. And this plant treats currently to secondary treatment, disinfects the water, and dis 
charges it out into the ocean. And um, what, a couple of interesting things about this plant. This plant, as Adele mentioned, uh, in the late 90s, this plant was doing about 375, 380 million gallons per day. So you could see the effects of water conservation. Water conservation really works. Uh, and, and, and so we've seen a drop of about uh, you know, 25, 30% just in our flows in our area from water conservation. Um, the second thing uh, I wanted to mention is that this plant, this was our original plant, started almost 100 years ago. And the concept for this plant was always to take the strongest wastes and our upstream plants that we were doing recycling from took more of the residential. So this plant has always had uh, essentially saltier water. And um, you know, up until about 15, 20 years ago, uh, technology and economics weren't there for water recycling from this facility. But obviously, and, and um, that's almost another talk, the technology is there. Uh, that can recycle even this saltier uh, wastewater cost effectively. Next slide, please. Once again, this reiterates a little bit of my, uh, the story that I was telling from our inception back in the 1920s. You could see the flow into our system. Originally, we just had the joint water pollution control plant and it discharged out to the ocean, but you can see in the early 60s, we started having um, water reclamation plants being built. There was a vision that, that we could uh, recycle the water and replenish the groundwater basins throughout uh, Los Angeles County. And you can see that we started those plants and we started them hoping that customers were going to come. And we had partners at that time with LA County Public Works, the Water Replenishment District, in the early 60s, and you can see the darker blue, uh, we were beneficially reusing a significant portion of it. But uh, over time, we've been trying to close that lighter blue, the highly treated but not reused uh, part of the graph. And, and you can see over time, um, we have uh, continually increased the amount of recycled water that's beneficially reused. And in the last few years, we've decreased the uh, amount that isn't uh, reused at all. So, um, but the untapped source is that ocean discharge. And if you go to the next slide, you can see, okay, we, we wanna recycle that water. We as an agency wanna convert waste into resources. We also do solid waste management. And um, you know we're big supporters of uh, zero waste initiatives as well. So how do we recycle the water from the joint plant? Well, because of uh, uh, duplication of service laws, we cannot uh, treat the water and then sell the water. There are water purveyors out there and water agencies, but it's not that easy. Um, you can see here, this is a map that shows all the water retailers in, in our service area. And we're one wastewater agency, and there's 119 water retailers, each with their own needs, with their own systems. Um, so you could see that clear, clearly part, trying to partner with these individually on a major project to, to move major volumes, just wasn't in the cards. We needed a partner that had uh, the size and uh, expertise to overcome you know, all of these issues with respect to these small agencies. And that's why um, the obvious solution was working with Metropolitan uh, Water District, the, the, the nation's largest wholesaler. Uh, this led us to start talks with their leadership over 10 years ago. And, 2008, 2009, we had started talking about the possibility or the potential of doing a, a project at the joint plant. And um, that really started us on the path. And I'll transition over to Adele on the next slide to really talk about the development of the partnership. Thank you, thank you, Robert. And, and really this, this uh, vision by LA County Sanitation District 
of having to recycle the water. And the, uh, the what in Metropolitan, we had the need and the vision to find new sources of water. Two alignments came together. And we've been really proud to work successfully. Next slide. Um, on building this partnership with the uh, LA County. So we have a larger service area we developed. As you know, we've been always focused on imported water, but really the shift now is we need to create more local water supply. And MET has to play a role in, in creating that and helping uh, on a regional basis, uh, this production. And we couldn't have a better partner than, than uh, LA County Sanitation District and their team they have and, uh, and, uh, and the work we've done. So we started the, the process, uh, the initial meeting to pilot uh, of, of advanced work uh, starting in 2009 to 2012. And then we, in 2015, we signed an agreement to pursue the demonstration scale treatment facility. Uh, we, we started designing it and building it in 2016 and we finished construction in 2017. That's at the Carson plant. And it's, uh, this is a picture of it. You see it in front of you. Uh, we completed the conceptual study for the program in 2019. And then the station facility started uh, a test that's about to wrap up uh, with successful results that's taken fully treated wastewater and sending it through the purification process using membrane bioreactors to get, to get it cleaned up. Uh, and reduce the footprint too. Uh, in 2020, uh, the agencies and both of us uh, expanded the agreement and agreed to move forward with the environmental uh, review. Uh, next slide. See, this this really it's about purifying water. You know, we know every water drop we have is recycled. There is no new water. It's our job is how we can harness that water, recycle it, and reuse it. Uh, and this program will turn wastewater into uh, pure water, new water supply for our region. Uh, the, you know, the, the source as, as Robert talked about is from their service area, from their wastewater system uh, across uh, the district uh, that flows, that currently flows to the ocean. So this water uh, will be sent through an advanced water purification system, and then it will be provided for reuse. Uh, and eventually that will uh, offset uh, our need for imported water and hopefully uh, get supplied through indirect or direct. We're hoping the regulations will help us uh, soon to be able to uh, go into direct portable uh, reuse. Next slide. This this program is actually truly uh, transformational. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen the bold action. I think Robert talked about what we need today is bold action. What we need today is major investments uh now we can't conserve our way out of what we're dealing with we can't just uh deal with uh you know little things here and there this is transformational and and right now we're at the moment in time what i call the mulholland moment which is the second mulholland moment is, is to transform the future and what you see before you is part of this fourth aqueduct so we're going to take the water uh, uh from the uh sanitation district uh, uh plant uh, that now flows into the ocean, move it uh, and, and treat it and build a pipeline system that will take it 60 miles into our service area, all the way north uh, and into the Santa Fe spreading grounds and come back around into our facilities. We have two treatment plants, Laverne, and also one in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in part of our Yorba Linda, and then come back uh, south into Orange County. So what we're, what we're doing is providing a, 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 a large augmentation of our water supply to provide us this resiliency that we need. Uh, we will provide water for industries, for irrigation, but also recharge in the groundwater. And hopefully in the future, and if we, the regulations change, we can really move forward into the future. Next slide. You know, it's, uh, we're estimating that, that through this program, 150 million gallons of pure water will be created, uh, enough for 500,000 homes uh, and 1.5 million people. Uh, and, and this is going to be drought proof, uh, ready to be used, rain or shine. It doesn't matter. And that's the resiliency approach that we have. This is really the benefit for water supply. The environmental benefit 
it closes the loop. It's, it helps us, uh, you know, uh, make the pie bigger for water to help the environment up in the Sierras, to help us in Lake Mead uh, and, and, and uh, address this issue. But also reusing every drop of water is the right thing to do for the environment. Economic benefit. You know, this is really, we, and, I, and I shared that today. Yes, I'm in D.C. right now when I was meeting with some of the uh, leaders here in D.C. and also had a meeting about really community wealth and, and helping communities grow. And, you know, part of the infrastructure funding from the bipartisan infrastructure bill is to ensure that there is justice 40. 40% 40 goes to uh, communities of color. And I think this is the chance that by doing this investment, we're going to create jobs, 50,000 jobs for the region. Uh, construction is about $8 billion in economic output. Operation and maintenance, $300 million annually in economic output. And, and so this is going to be transformational. It's going to be great. And our goal is to hire from the community, provide this opportunity to uplift communities. Because I think what we do here is not just infrastructure, it's people uplifting people's lives through water protection, through jobs, through environmental protection and enhancements. And at the end of the day, what we all are doing is making sure the water is safe. We're providing reliable sources of water, cleaning up the water. But at the end of the day, it's uplifting people's lives. And that's really what I believe strongly the future. Next slide. The question is money. And as I'm in DC trying to figure out how we can you know, uh, help ourselves, we have a new uh, appropriation in the uh, bipartisan uh, infrastructure for 450 million dollars for uh, large recycled water projects and we'll ha hopefully get some of that money moving quickly to us here but it's the cost is is, is high it's 3.4 billion dollars annual ONM is 129 million dollars the average cost for an acre foot is 1800 dollars which is still it's to me is uh, a lot of people ask isn't that expensive said so the cost of no water is a lot more expensive <laughs> And I think a lot of us don't 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 get that discussion. So we really are, are really asking right now our partners, both at the state and the federal government. I was here talking to the senators and Congress members and Department of the Interior, Bureau of Reclamation, EPA. We need to have them help us because I think this project is not just a LA project. It's not a, a metropolitan Southern California project. This is a state project, a regional project for the entire Southwest. And that's why we have a partnership with uh, Nevada, Arizona, and putting money on the table because they see this helping us on the Colorado River. And as you know, we're, we're going through negotiations right now on how to uh, manage the drought in the Colorado, how to split the water as, as we are trying to get to a new agreement, drought agreement uh, for, for this effort. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's something that we're working really hard. And, uh, and I think that's something that we will be working our goal is to reduce the impact on our rate payers uh, by getting grants from both the state and the federal government and, and move forward and get this moving quickly, uh, hopefully in the near future. Next slide. Let me, let me uh, talk a little bit more uh, about keys to partnership. And, and uh, next slide. You know, uh, Metropolitan is, is, we are looking at every way and everything we do. We just finished our integrated resource plan uh, this by this uh, hopefully end of this year. And then we're gonna start this one water uh, implementation plan to close the gaps. We, in 2045 plan, looking for where the gaps are and the gaps vary from 200,000 acre feet to 1.3 million acre feet. And the whole thing is how we can close the gap and we need to plan for it. And this is an anchor. This, this untapped wastewater is the future. Unfortunately, 20 years ago, this whole thing that was put out is totally to tap, set us back 20, 25 years ago. And I, I, this is the chance right now to push forward. The technology is there and we need to partner with everyone. And we couldn't find a better partner than, than LA County Sanitation. And that's something that's happening up and down the coast. I mean, you'll go to San Diego, that's being done, Orange County, led the way on that effort and we thank him for this work. There's a lot of effort happening in our partners in the city of Los Angeles, similar to what we're doing, almost the same size. And then you look at Las Virginis and, and what they're doing with, with pure water uh, or uh, pure water Las Virginis. Um, we are regional, all of us are regional and our job too is to kind of 
take the blinders off and work together and collaborate. And this partnership is not just a partnership with just us technology people or or, or agency people. Now this is a partnership with the community, with our, our construction partners, consultant partners, environmental partners. Everyone has to have a stake in this. This is the future and this is the what we need to, to work together on. We both were formed in 1920s, uh, but I'll tell you, Robert, you and I are going to transform these agencies to the new agencies, the future agencies to come bring us all together. Next slide. Uh, you know, this is the, the partnerships and what we have. You see, everybody is here, Central Basin and everybody, WRD. This take, it takes all of us, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, the U.S. Army Corps, uh, Arizona, Nevada, uh, Southern Nevada, uh, you know, Public Works, uh, uh, LA County Public Works, Water and Power. We all have to work together, Upper San Gabriel. It's, it's just something that we all are proud of. And we need to continue working together uh, with our groundwater uh, partners, our, our water masters, uh, our agencies uh, that do replenishment. All this is critical, and this is what we are doing. Next slide. You know, it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm I actually so proud of, of uh, the team we have uh, Devin, Martha from Alicante Sanitation, uh, Devin Aparhe, and, and his team, and all of them are working really hard. And I haven't, you know, I went there to visit the site and I'll just tell you, I'm so proud of, of how it's seamless. People, I can't tell who's Metropolitan, who's LA County Sanitation. They're so seamless, so great together, working together. And the technology is amazing. The, using bioreactors, uh, you know, finding ways to see how we can really get to direct portable reuse, how to help in the workforce development. We're pioneering research and moving forward. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, so, so thankful and so grateful for this because the, we have a chance in time right now to really uh, help transform our water future and 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 reduce our water footprint, but also reduce our our overall dependence on imported water and provide people resilient and affordable water for everyone. With that, I'll turn it over to Robert. Thanks, Adele. Um, I just want to kind of expand a little bit on the collaboration and the partnership between uh, the two agencies. But before I talk about just the two agencies, I think Adele really mentioned that, you, you know, we're kind of the, the face of this uh, recycled water project because I, but I think you noticed how many other partners that we have uh, between the groundwater basins, uh, the member agencies of MED, LA County that have to share in the vision that we have uh, for this project to be successful. Talking a little bit more about uh, us and Matt and, and our relationship, you know, it, it's one thing for general managers to, to, you know, sit down, go to lunch and have a good relationship, but for the partnership to be successful, it really needs to be the staffs that need to work together. Uh, and, it, and it's not just staff that are developing the the technical project it's everything to the you know the financing the the outreach the tremendous amount of public outreach that is necessary for this and one of the keys that uh i've seen uh with respect to the uh our staffs working together is exactly what adele mentioned that when you sit down at a meeting you really can't tell who's district staff and who's metropolitan staff um, you know, the leadership teams alone have met over 30 times over the last uh, few years. Uh, we meet routinely to move things forward. Our staff have met even more and, and on subgroups. And those relationships are so important, uh, not only at the high levels, but at the, at the mid, mid levels of staff. And sharing the technical expertise together, I think, is very important. It's our laboratory. It's our permitting groups. It's working together on a common message, you know, the state of California is looking at the pot uh, direct potable reuse regulations, working together on those as well. And one other element that we've talked about since day one is that it, it'd be easy for the two partners to say, well, let's, you know, let's make this easy. Let's put a, a fence between our property and our side and your side and, 
we'll deal with things on our side, you deal with things on your side, but that is not the approach we've taken. Uh, for this project, we've really looked at it from uh, the minute the wastewater is discharged into our system, looking at things like pretreatment and source control that we can do, and all the way through conveyance to what Metropolitan can do in terms of groundwater replenishment, blending the water with their Colorado and state uh, supplies, uh, putting it through additional treatment, giving it additional residence time. So looking, drawing the box around that whole system as opposed to having two boxes that are working together. Uh, that, that, that uh, hopefully you understood me on that, but that's very important on that, that we're looking at one overall system because as Adele mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's all one water. So uh, we need to be careful about what we discharge into the sewer system because that is going to be purified later. And if we can uh, have some uh, cost savings and efficiency savings by being more careful, it's worth it. We don't build facilities that are gonna operate for five years or 10 years. We build, both of our agencies build in essence forever facilities. So we need to think along that long-term uh, horizon. And we're very grateful to working with Metropolitan and not only Metropolitan, but their member agencies have been very supportive too in, in undertaking this and moving forward. And with that, could you move to the next slide as we transition now and we look at well, what are the next steps? So just a couple of weeks ago, we've hired, we've already hired the consultants the team has, and we started the environmental review process. Obviously, this is a complex project. It's not just an advanced treatment system at one location. There's the conveyance, uh, miles and miles of conveyance through a number of cities that needs to be looked at, as well as other issues with respect to uh, just the water treatment and water reuse. A key component of this is the extensive outreach. Uh, you know, every time we meet, we get an update on the outreach meetings, and there are meetings occurring essentially weekly with different groups, whether they be uh, government stakeholders, environmental groups, community groups, uh, and um, you know, even regulators as well, keeping them informed of our progress and keeping them involved in the process. One of the things that we're looking at as part of this overall system is potentially uh, nitrogen management on our joint water pollution control plant. Uh, currently, our plant does not uh, treat uh, for nitrogen, does not remove nitrogen, but there uh, could be significant benefits for advanced treatment by removing nitrogen and also additional benefits to us for the uh, residual amount of water that uh, still is discharged out into the environment. So that is something, and that's part of looking at, the, at this program as one system and not two systems. And finally, all of this work will require uh, strong uh, relationships with the regulators, especially the regional board, public health, and the state for them to understand what we're doing. This is not only novel for us, for many of them, this is a novel project as well. So coming up to speed and having the confidence that we can uh, effectively treat the water and safely treat the water is going to be very important in getting their buy-in from the beginning and also getting their understanding of the uh, mitigation that's necessary uh, for a project of this magnitude too we have to work with uh, the regulators on communicating that. Next slide. A little bit on the uh, program schedule. Uh, we're currently in the environmental planning phase. Uh, we estimate that that'll take about, uh, you know, two years uh, and a little bit. Uh, we're really looking at 2024 to complete that process and to transition from the planning phase into okay, uh, everything's fully green lighted. Let's move on to design and construction. Uh, and design and construction, um, if I can step back a little bit, um, this project has many different elements and we are committed to trying to, as, as all of you know, California is in a drought today. California has issues with water today. The sooner we can get 
the uh, pipeline flowing from this project, the better off the region, the state, and the Southwest is. So we're all committed to moving forward as quickly as possible. So we may uh, do the design in different phases with the conveyance going simultaneously with the treatment to try and accelerate things so that the construction can be uh, done as quickly as possible. Currently, we estimate startup uh, in 2032. Uh, a lot of that depends upon our final uh, preliminary engineering and what the project actually looks like in terms of what systems it has, what conveyance route it has, and um, uh, all of how the, the, the system will work. But we're optimistic that we can meet that deadline. Next slide, please. And, and just really to, to summarize, uh, as Adele is saying, you know, the environment recycles the water for us. So all we're doing is accelerating what mother nature does for us. And we're creating purified water. The water from uh, this uh, system will be so purified, we actually have to add minerals back in. Um, and the other key component of this, and, and Adele touched on it too, is the fact that this is a local new supply. This will go towards replenishing groundwater basins that will be critical during extended droughts. That is our security deposit. That is our, our, our bank vault that we can uh, uh, cash in during the extended drought. And ultimately it'll lead to resilience through, it, through that time period. We hope in the future uh, that we, when, when California is experiencing very little rainfall, very little snow, we're, we're not talking about the fact that we're going to be going through a, a water crisis because we've built systems like this and because our partners at other agencies have built systems like these. With that, uh, if you can move on to the next slide, um, that really concludes uh, our presentation. And uh, I think we're going to kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive and discussion with you all in a networking session. And I think I'll hand it over to back to Wendy to talk a little bit about the breakout rooms and, and uh, what we'll be doing over the next 15 minutes or so. Absolutely. And I love that, Robert. All water is recycled. And then the quote from Adele that I liked best was our second Mulholland moment. So for all of you who are out there, we're going to, in the spirit of innovation, try something new. So keep yourself muted, but do turn your cameras on. We are going to go into three different breakout rooms. Uh, join me in kind of silently thanking Robert and Adele. And keep in mind, they're going to be here to answer specific questions after this this networking discussion. So at this point, we're going to go into three different rooms, and Lilia and I will be in breakout room number three, and you're going to go through a guided discussion. We'll come back and report out. So if you want to go put it, go ahead and start putting us in breakout rooms, Marissa, we're ready for it. Um, we had very brief, we got, we got kind of through, we were, we, our goal in our group was, oh, I guess I should share what our question is. Brian, do you have the question? Do you want me to share? I'll just, I think what I'll do is I'll read it off and then I'll let um, our scribe Lilia start reporting out. Um, but actually, we need to go through uh, group one first. Sorry about that. I'm super excited. So group one was facilitated by Martin and Adele. So we'd be interested in hearing them report out and I guess start by reading your questions since the other groups didn't see those. Well, sure. Let me just say that because um, we had such an intimate group that we just uh, we just spent a time a little bit more time getting to know one another. Our topic was about uh, collaboration among the regulatory agencies. So that may come up in the Q&A session, uh, because I think what really was um, presented in our breakout room was, was the fact that California is really in this leadership role. 
we had the opportunity of uh, uh, of someone from uh, uh, well, an agency based in Virginia, someone in from Tennessee, and local experience there that was really talking about um, how the work that we're doing um, is uh, is being looked at uh, from well beyond the boundaries of California. So success in this in this project is uh, going to have ripple effects beyond California. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you for that, Martin. Oh, wait, I think Adele wants to say somebody. Uh, we can't Wonderful. Hear you, Adele. Adele, Adele, can you unmute yourself? And for those of you, now that I have like a little PSA moment, I'm an outreach person, so I'm always announcing things. Turn your turn your cameras on if you if you don't mind. We'd, we'd love to see faces. Adele, we're still not able to hear you. We'll try to figure it out and come back to you. Go ahead, Wendy. All right, no, no worries, Martin. Um, excellent observations from group one. And now I will turn it over to Brian and perhaps the scribe for group two, kind of go through the question and uh, talk about some of the discussion there. But I am excited by what Martin said that we had a small intimate group. And instead of multitasking, you guys took the time to, to get to know one another and really start to collaborate and think about these complex issues. So that's my takeaway from that. And uh, go ahead and take it away, Brian. Hi, everybody. Yeah, group two, the, the prompt was, how has your organization uh, developed a project where collaboration was critical and success required letting go of some control? And uh, if so, what approaches did you use to identify collaborative solutions? So some of the things that, that we talked about as a group was the need for partnerships uh, across the board at, at many levels. Uh, Buy-in from elected leaders is, is really critical as well as the public. A lot of what we're doing it costs money and, and the public's gotta, gotta support those expenditures. Uh, we also need um, a variety of expertise to do the research and the design that these projects require. Uh, it requires partners with a shared vision to, to, to go through these things because it's, it's often a, a long road with some twists and turns. Um, one of the comments was, uh, when you look at a project like the Regional Recycle Water Program from a public perspective, hopefully the public will be more supportive because there's a tangible local benefit compared to something like the Delta Convenience Project, which is, you know, hundreds of miles away from everybody. Um, and last, there, there's some discussion about how outreach is just so critical, especially, you know, now when I think back to like 30 years ago, I think agencies are more you, you kind of do your project and try to defend it from the public accusations and that, that kind of approach doesn't work anymore. Uh, and with a lot of people doing recycled water, there, there's value in consistent messaging and actually uh, many of the water agencies in LA are, are, are meeting now regularly trying to come up with some consistent messages so that our communications with the public are more effective. Thank you. Oh, that's great, Brian. So some some real key takeaways there. And I'm hearing a theme about how consensus building and outreach is so important to these complex um, environmental issues and, and really to regional solutions. So now I'm going to put my um, my cohort on. Um, Lilia, did you want to report out? Do you want me to start by by reading our question? Uh, Lilia, you're muted, which is very polite, but we'd All love right. to hear your voice. <laughs> Thank you. I said you may read it and then I'll report it out. Thank okay. You. Okay. So our question was, as we strive to recycle more water to help our communities meet their needs, there can be unintended consequences. So for example, when more water is recycled, less is discharged to rivers where that water might support habitat. What approaches do you recommend to find that balance between societal and environmental needs? And we continued Brian's theme, by the way, that what is most important is community outreach. We need to have more community outreach, not only with the upstream users, which I think the five-year study paid more attention to, 
in trying to determine their needs and balancing their needs against the other needs and making more water available to them. But towards the end, Nader came back and said, yes, but we also need extensive public outreach on the downstream users as well. That all in all public outreach must be collective. It can't be one or the other as Adele and Mr. Ferrante said it's one box and we have to balance, have to hear from both and balance the needs. And the key is extensive and effective public outreach, listening to the public, judging their needs and solving a collaborative problem. That's fantastic, Lilia. Wow, Lilia, you did a beautiful job of explaining our rather uh, disjointed discussion. So thank you for that. Um, so the takeaways that I got from everybody's discussion is to be inclusive, to invite stakeholders to set a mission and a goal and a vision, and make sure they're defined when you're addressing these complex issues, set criteria and measure progress. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oh, actually Adele, I think you had a little more to contribute, but I'm going to open it up for those who have questions for our keynote speakers. That's the next portion, but Adele had a little audio trouble, so I know you had something to contribute in the very well, beginning. I, just, I think when, in our session, one of the, we tried to find examples of collaboration with regulators, and I tell you, on the LA County stormwater uh, permit, uh, where we really worked hard on changing the permitting of stormwater from being uh, basically a pollution base to a, a water supply uh, uh, multi-benefit based approach, which really changed the game that led to um, Measure W, which is the bond measure that we have uh, in, in, in the LA County. Uh, to me, so, so when you bring people together and look at things differently as, as regulators, community folks and, and, and regulated and leaders were able to do that. So it's a, it's a good thing. And uh, I'll tell you that stormwater program permitting process changed the game for us that that changed how we manage stormwater in LA County. So just share that example. That's fantastic. So if anybody has questions that they would like, we have kind of a nice small group. We thought we were going to have a lot more. So this is fantastic. If you want to kind of raise your hand or just unmute yourself and, and ask a question, otherwise I'll start it off with some of the questions that we saw um, throughout our broadcast. So I think, I think Robert, you really did a great job of this, but there is a question for you about what agreements need to be in place to support building the regional recycled water program facility on the sanitation district's pro property and then it's going to be operated by our sister agency metropolitan sure um so yeah we we do have already uh, a couple of agreements with metropolitan with respect to uh, initial uh, an initial one for the demo plant then moving forward uh, and we will need subsequent agreements to to uh, further the project. Um, you know, one thing that I, I uh, do want to touch on, it's a little bit of a tangent from the question, but we are very fortunate that uh, years ago, uh, previous chief engineers before my time uh, acquired additional property envisioning the potential for uh, a project like this. And um, because you can imagine to have 30 acres that you can put advanced treatment on in uh, LA County is not a simple thing to find. Uh, it's not a simple thing to, uh, to even permit a brand new facility. So putting it adjacent to our wastewater treatment plant is really a win-win. And, um, you know, we will need agreements for, for you know, what kind of water is conveyed and what the responsibilities are with respect to the sanitation districts and, and metropolitan. Uh, once we move from, uh, you know, right now we're in the environmental phase, design phase, and then definitely once we move into the operations phase. And a lot of those decisions, frankly, we haven't been made. Um, and some would say, oh gosh, you don't know, you know, exactly who's gonna operate what. 
But once again, uh, we we don't want to, you know, the expression, don't want to put the cart before the horse. We want to see exactly what the most efficient system is going to look like. And then we can decide who operates what, who pays for what, how do we get the funding? That's, that's you know, uh, the best way to move forward with, a, with, with an engineering mindset in terms of building the best system first, as opposed to kind of saying, well, we're not going to handle that no matter whether it's, you know, uh, more efficient or not. So that is a big uh, part of things moving forward. So a lot of that is dynamic as we move forward. So Marvin has a question. Marvin, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question directly? Or would Yes, uh, I was wondering um, what role do you think the salination will play in providing uh, water in the future in Southern California and even the southwestern U.S. more generally? I mean, maybe maybe I'll take that, uh, Robert. And, yeah. Uh, when we, so I, 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 one of the things that uh, we are looking at is, um, you know, diesel is a tool in the toolbox. It's, uh, it's a, as you know, it's costly. It's about three thousand dollars an acre foot. Uh, it's uh, energy intensive and still has some concerns, environmental concerns. The question that we're saying is, it's a tool in the toolbox, and and what we need is determine how can we uh, use the most accessible water uh, where, you know, where you have uh, available water that has multi-benefits in the beginning and find there's areas possibly that may not be supplied with resilient water. The only option that's available is the ocean and, and, and the cell. So we believe that that's a tool in the toolbox, but may not be uh, a one that we're gonna just jump all in. Uh, with that, uh, there is a, a plant, as you know, in Carlsbad, uh, 56,000 acre foot uh, uh, desal plant. There's discussion about a Huntington Beach plant that is in the permitting process with the, with the, the Coastal Commission. But I believe is it has to be done part of our one water uh, plan to close the gap. And in, in some areas, we may have to look for other uh, uh, sources of water and diesel is a tool in the toolbox. But I uh, just want to make sure that we're not going to just go build diesel all along the coast. It's going to be part of a, 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 a puzzle or part of the one water plan. That's fantastic. Oh, oh go ahead, Mark. It's the most prohibitive uh, part of diesel, and that's an out, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> I didn't hear the question at the end. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, is it safe to say that the cost is what is the most prohibitive in terms of using D cell as a as a big, uh, uh, you know, part of the whole water supply? Uh, yeah. Puzzle? So so cost is a big thing. The other one is environmental impacts, and there is a lot of concern uh, from environmental community NGOs on that issue. Uh, but I think there is there's always a place to work it. And, 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 and the other one that we're looking at is, is somewhere uh, there is a issue with salt uh, on our water that's coming from the Colorado River and other places. You know, that could be uh, diesel without really being off the ocean. Uh, there is also discussion around Imperial Irrigation around the Salton Sea area. So there's a lot of discussion happening across the whole region of what needs to be done. But as you know, the Colorado River water is uh, has high salinity, and that may be at some point we may have to do some salt removal uh, just to uh, make it uh, uh, more acceptable uh, and also to minimize the flushing that farmers have to do because of salt. So uh, there's there's bigger than just uh, than just uh, getting ocean water out and uh, and actually what you look at what you're doing in, in the uh, project, the Regional Recycled Water Project, a lot of it is using the same technology, the, the membrane technology, uh, but the only thing you have is you have the MBR ahead of it. So, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it. So, uh, that, actually, that actually, that oh, actually brings up, go ahead. Oh, Wendy, if I can just add to, you know, to Adele's comments with respect to salt removal, 
is that, uh, as he just mentioned, the technology is similar that we're looking at to a desal plant, but the, the difference is, of course, ocean water is, is what, 20 times saltier than, than our water that we have our effluent at the joint plant. So that's why it requires even more energy, more reverse osmosis to remove that uh, salt from the water. So, and that's why the low hanging fruit is to treat the recycled water and it, it, it can be done at a lower cost. Oh, that's fantastic. And then the next question is for Adele. You got everybody excited about your program and they're saying that 2032 seems like a long way off. Is there any way to compress the schedule? Adele, you're talking, but we're not hearing. <laughs> What's going on here? Uh, I switched to my phone just to make it work. Can you hear me? Yes. So perfect. Uh, you know, 100% agreed. Uh, I actually have been talking to Robert and his team, my team, about accelerating the delivery. And, uh, and we're looking for, as you know, new ways that we can probably do a, some alternative delivery of this project. Uh, our chief engineer is talking to uh, the team at LA County. Uh, sanitation district and also our staff are thinking about maybe we can do the 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 conveyance and and the storage and the recharge components uh, ahead of the game because what would that will do is bias time to uh, during the next rain event the next amount of next year that we have uh, uh, water available from the Colorado or from uh, in the state water project or stormwater uh, rain, we can uh, start using the facilities to recharge the basins using uh, water that's available, excess water that's available to us during wet years while we are working towards the technology at the treatment plant. So there is ways maybe we can, I said, deliver it backwards and do the pipeline and do the recharge ahead of time and use it for many years as we move forward through this. And one thing that we need to do is demanding the permitting process has to be expedited. Uh, you know, this is, I mean, if you build, I'll just be frank, when we had, when, 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 when SoFi Stadium had to be built, every, every uh, permit process and everything was done expedited as an emergency. This is an emergency. This is like, you know, when you talk about earthquakes and building the 10, the, the 10 freeway uh, during a collapse after the uh, Northridge earthquake, this is the same thing. This is the same as the Katrina flooding, but we're saying we, 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 we are, we need to treat it the same way. This is a emergency, urgency, catastrophe. And I, I and I'm, I'm just, I'm not demand everyone uh, from every permanent agency, from the state, everyone who's working with us, treat this as a uh, emergency. And, and I'll tell you, we're going to do everything we know. I know Robert and his team is thinking hard about how we expedite. My team is thinking hard how we expedite. We're going to ask for help from everyone to think outside the box. But at the end of the day, also, we need our permanent partners from the state and the federal government and the local government and the everyone, the Court of Engineers, to help us move things forward fast and, and really treat this with an urgency that needs to be treated with. Oh, that's fantastic, Adele. And the next question is for Robert. Um, the question is, is there was a lot of talk about salt and is the brine from the Regional Recycled Water Project facility going to cause any process issues for the joint plant? So that, that is a very good question because that is uh, one of the issues that we're looking at and doing research on right now. You know, Adele mentioned that uh, Orange County um, uh, Water and uh, the Water District and the Sanitation Agency have been doing a recycled water project down there. And um, they do discharge the brine out the clean, it's clean brine. It's, it's after it's gone through the treatment plant, then it goes through the advanced treatment uh, system. So the brine is clean, but they have been looking to see if that concentrated brine what the toxicity of it is and what the impact on the environment is. So we also have been looking already at some of the information we're collecting um, uh, during the demonstration phase, looking at the brine and looking at its uh, toxicity and making sure that it is safe to discharge that residual. 
the issue is if if that residual um, cannot go back to the ocean for whatever reason, then it, it is incredibly expensive to to somehow treat that brine. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're looking at a, a lot higher costs. So that needs to be a viable option moving forward. And that's why we're already working on it now. But as far as upsetting the joint plant process, it shouldn't. It can go out right the back of uh, our treatment plant and into we have two tunnels that uh, connect uh, off of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, connect into outfalls, and then it gets uh, discharged two miles offshore, two, 200 feet un under the uh, surface of water. So it shouldn't impact the joint plant, but we're making sure it doesn't impact the environment. That's great, Robert, thank you. And speaking of dollars, the next question is for Adele. Adele, you said that the local source of clean water from the Regional Recycled Water Program facility is expected to cost about $1,800 per acre foot in 2018 dollars. How does that compare to the cost of imported water? Yeah, imported water is actually, if you look at uh, what people pay right now, it's about 800 untreated and about $1,100,000 treated. It's $300, I think, uh, surcharge on treatment if you get it treated. So mm -hmm. it, it, there is about, you know, uh, you know, six, $700 difference probably. Uh, but I think it's uh, what I said before is uh, the value of, uh, of of no water is, is a lot more expensive. As we all know that water is, is critical for all of us, yeah. No, that makes complete sense. And the next question is kind of a, a follow-up, well, it's related um, to that, Adele. It says that um, you are estimating that the cost, cost of the facility is 3.4 billion, if I'm correct, um, is, Metropolitan eligible, and that's probably why you're in DC for funding to help develop this drought proof local supply under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act? Uh, the answer is, is, is yes. Uh, we have actually worked really hard um, on with our, uh, especially uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Napolitano, in ensuring that there is actually a separate part of money for uh, a large recycled water project for the Western region here. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, we got a huge support from Arizona and Nevada, and it's about $450 million. There is also Build Back Better, there's some discussion about adding another $100 million to that part, it'll be $550 million. Uh, also, we're asking the governor and the state here uh, as they, they start thinking about the, uh, the future of uh, the surplus, $31 billion, and maybe there's a way we can put that money in uh, and help some of us move this forward. Because at the end of the day, uh, our ratepayers have to pay for this. If we can help them uh, take that uh, burden off uh, our ratepayers, especially that 50 to 60 percent of our water rate payers uh, are actually underserved communities. So uh, uh, every every dollar helps, and our partnership with Nevada, Arizona, also is good because we've had some financial agreement on the on the planning side, and hoping as we do construction, they'll be willing to invest construction dollars that will help uh, uh, with the uh, uh, you know offsetting some of the import water that we have from Colorado and we can uh, store more water in Lake Mead uh, as a result of this to bring the level up for everyone. So there's a lot of uh, more regional partnership and, uh, and, and California partnership. And hopefully whatever we can do to reduce the impact on rate pairs, we will do everything we can. Oh, that's fantastic, Adele, thank you. And Marvin had a follow-up question for Robert. Marvin, do you want to unmute yourself? Are you safe to do so? Or do you want me to ask your question? You want me to ask it? Okay. Robert, is there a market for selling any brine that can't safely be discharged back into the environment? So, yeah, that's that's an interesting question uh, because over the last few years, people have looked at treatment plants and tried to re recover more of the minerals from the wastewater. So um, we haven't done a, a lot of research in this, but to answer your question, there might be. Um, 
Uh, I'm not sure there'll be a market where uh, somebody would be maybe willing to pay for it. Uh, they may be willing to take it or, uh, you know, um, it, it all depends. But obviously at this point, the uh, most cost effective and what others are doing is discharging it uh, back into the ocean uh, bodies. And hopefully we can continue to do that. I mean, but we're always concerned, you know, there's things like PFAS, there's other contaminants of emerging concern that we have to keep an eye on. And that's why it's so important that we look at this at one system and what comes into our sewer system, even if we can remove it from uh, obviously from the purified water, and we will, we still have to be concerned about, you know, do, does it get removed in our treatment plan or does it only get separated? And if it gets separated into the brine, what are the impacts on the environment? So that is a good question and we'll have to look at that more as we move forward. Oh, great. Well, th thank you, Robert. Um, so we have time for about one more question, and I have one for, um, it's the same question I'm going to ask first Robert, and then I'm going to ask Adele. So Adele, you might want to pay attention to Robert's answer. <laughs> so what are the next steps for the sanitation districts, and how can each of us here help to make the regional recycled water program a reality and by here I mean in this interactive forum and then also the next steps for the sanitation districts for Robert. Yeah so I guess that those are really two questions. I'll answer the first question first that the big step for us is all about looking at the um, uh, kind of the master planning, the preliminary engineering now that we're doing. We're trying to decide uh, fundamentally whether it, um, it'd be beneficial to really change the treatment process at our plant for this project. Right now we use high purity oxygen secondary treatment. And uh, one of the, as Adele mentioned, the demo plant has been giving us information. Well, up until now, it's taken the secondary effluent to test. Now we're going to be sending it uh, primary effluent and see how it performs and see if fundamentally we should be changing out our secondary treatment uh, into more of a, a you know, biological membrane uh, MBR type of uh, system. So that is the big thing that the districts is doing. And of course, looking at the overall project um, as well in terms of uh, the CEQA and the preliminary engineering supporting uh, Metropolitan or, and our other partners. With respect to what people can do with this project is, is continue, continue their support. Uh, you know, uh, Rupam uh, down uh, works for Metropolitan and, and uh, the public information and, and she's the face for this project down there giving a lot of tours and the response has been overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly positive, not only from uh, local leaders, but the public that comes in and tours the site. But we always have to be wary of, of concerns, um, you know, concerns about cost, concerns about other issues. And, and I think if we can collectively, and, and this is why I, I say it's not, only, it's not only one water, it's one vision. And, and I've mentioned this before that, you know, we can work well together with Metropolitan, but if our supporters and if the public and elected leaders aren't supportive, with our vision, we're never gonna be able to move forward. So it really takes all of Southern California kind of moving in the same direction because this, this project will impact and will benefit in a positive way, all of Southern California. So continue to support the project. Uh, we will have outreach. If, if you're a consultant, obviously there's a lot of opportunities uh, for not only planning, outreach, design, construction, there's a lot of work that's going to be coming that's also going to be a benefit to Southern California. So that would be my message uh, to the community at large. Thank you, Robert. That's fantastic. And before we let Adele answer that last question, we're going to have one more last chance. So Sharon, did you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question directly? You're welcome to do so. Yeah, there you go. Think, thank you, Wendy. 
Thank you for Robert and Adele for the great presentation. So that's has some like a, the engineering mind. Um, so could you explain, uh, elaborate some more about the flow at the uh, JW PCP? Will all the treated effluent be sent into the recycle facility or is only some portion like reclaimable? So how you decided which stream is reclaimable, not reclaimable? So I think I, from the beginning and my understanding, so the the JWB PCP you reach uh, the 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 influent is a saltier than the other municipal sewage. So what's the challenge of that affecting you know decide which which stream is reclaimable or not reclaimable? It sounds like a still a big portion uh, from 250 mgd influent to produce 150. That's a still big portion of it, would you please elaborate some more sure. on the flow? No, Thank you. Those, those, are, those are great questions. So just a little bit about the joint plant. The joint plant primarily uh, is, is the plant in our system that takes the most industrial flow. Um, the industrial flow to the plant is about 17 to 20 percent of the flow, whereas our water reclamation plants, it's, it's just a couple of percent at most to any of those treatment plants. And that's why it is a little saltier. We do not really have the ability to bifurcate our flow, to, to, to modify our flow. I know Orange County, um, they had a very industrial line, uh, sewer line uh, that contained almost, uh, you know, mostly industrial flows, and they did not want to um, reclaim that line. We are really looking at this because of the technology that all, all of our flow is recyclable. The, the reason why we've talked about doing 150 is because to produce 150 million gallons per day, you need about 180, 190 uh, million gallons of, uh, of uh, inflow into the advanced treatment. Uh, and that is our low flow point overnight. Uh, our low flow point actually comes to about 200 or so. So we felt with the margin of safety, we can reliably baseline the advanced water treatment system and, and have 100, 180, 185 million gallons per day, always going through a flow rate, producing 150 million gallons of water. I say that now, but I would, one thing we are looking at is the ability to have flow equalization and storage at our facility to be able to actually um, streamline the flow across the plant and then base load an even higher amount to the advanced water treatment. Uh, that is something that we're looking at now during the preliminary engineering and we're looking at the CEQA where we're, very confident that 150 MGD can be produced all the time, but we're all also looking at, can we run all of the water at the plant through an advanced treatment system and maximize the amount of water production? Oh, that's exciting. Well, this brings up our last question for real this time. So Adele, we'll go back. Um, what are the next steps for Metropolitan? I know you covered some of those in your talk. And then um, what's your take on what each of us in this forum can do to support the program? Um, so thank you, Robert. And, and I think it's uh, what we need to do is finish the, you know, the environmental process is critical looking for ways to expedite delivery, uh, work on the permitting, but at the end of the day, we need to bring it back to our board for action on uh, financing and funding. Uh, so uh, I think that's gonna be the most critical part uh, is when we bring it back for uh, funding. Uh, and and, and uh, that's uh, something that I look forward to it because that's really the green light uh, to move forward. And uh, everybody should advocate uh, for this project and it's, uh, to me, I call it the, the uh, one water project is the one water uh, uh, solution uh, that we have. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, mitigate some of the costs by getting some help from the federal and state uh, funding uh, to reduce impact on our ratepayers. But at the end of the day, it's, uh, if we don't do something now, you know, uh, it's, it's gonna be so critical as we're seeing with the, uh, uh, some of the zero allocation on the state water project 
that's causing causing a lot of our folks that are dependent on the state for our project concerns as a means to their uh, economy and impact to the economy. So uh, let's just get this going. I, I just can't say how appreciative I am for the partnership with Robert and his team. Uh, it's just, uh, it's amazing. We all have to, what I call, uh, you know, take throw the hat, um, our individual hat off and wear this collaborative hat and build this big tent so we all fit in and work together. And water doesn't know boundaries and neither should we make boundaries. So uh, build, build boundaries, we should open everything up. We're all together um, collaborating and, and I'm excited that I was able to join, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Adele. Great, great closing words. Well, thank you to everyone for participating in our very first, you guys made history today. Soon, perhaps in 2022, we're again going to be able to host in-person networking events. Um, the recording of this will be available on the Academy's website. And I hope those of you who have joined us will consider applying for board certification through the Academy. Um, all of the attendees for this, and I think even those who registered will be entered into a drawing to waive the application and testing fees. I did mention it's a rigorous credentialing process. So waiving the fees doesn't mean you get the certification. Um, if you have any questions regarding membership, I don't know, Marissa, can you put your information in the chat really quick? Or maybe um, I can. <laughs> All right. She's the right person for it. Anyway, um, good luck. And thank you, everyone. And oh, wow, great speakers. Bye-bye.